So I decided today that I would talk about the idea of why do good things or why do bad things happen to good people. And notice in that statement, I didn't say bad people. I said good people. Because everyone is what? At the core of their being, the divine expressing. So I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to build from that. And what we teach at Agape, we do not believe in an anthropomorphic God. Let me use the word anthropomorphic and state clearly, it means that we have not attached a human image to something that we call God. So anthropomorphic means the idea of making something that is not human, making it and giving it human qualities. So we don't believe in an anthropomorphic God because how small would that be of us? When you look out into the cosmos and you see that there is an infinite expression. There's no limits to the solar system. There's no limits to the galaxies. Science cannot find where it begins or where it stops. They've actually come to the point, I don't know if the masses know this, but the scientists out there today know there was no Big Bang Theory. They debunked it. That's all poop. So the Earth or the cosmos didn't begin 14 billion years ago. That's just hooey. Right now, they've only got theories, but the theories are all that it's always been and it always will be. The idea that it always will be is how does it continue? Stars are going out. Well, science has already proven that black holes taking in stars and solar systems and that, or galaxies in it, it takes it in, it destroys them, and out the other end is a white hole, and they come out of that, and when they come out of it, they start rebirthing, and they recreate themselves as stars and planets and solar systems. So we have a recycling cosmos going on. So if you take that there's an infinite power and presence, and we identify it with this idea that there's a consciousness, a mind that's beyond all out there, and that we are individualizations of that mind. So the consciousness that is Lee, the consciousness that is Jim, the consciousness that is Mary, is an individualization of the whole. And that consciousness is within this physical body and is responding to the mind, which is interpreting consciousness. And the body has an experience. So my consciousness, or your consciousness, is infinite. It knows no bounds, but the mind that we have limits the ability of that consciousness to perceive. The more we become aware, the more we awaken, the greater we're able to use that consciousness to create. So when we build this consciousness, at first we don't have a clue, because we're babies. Where babies were fed our mothers and our fathers' consciousness, and our uncles and our aunts' consciousness, and our grandparents' consciousness. The next thing you know, today we're in daycare, whatever daycare facility we go in, we get that consciousness going on. That started to dump on us. And by daycare, we're not really at a point where we're deciding what we want. Then we start into school, and what happens in school? Well, we got to start getting fed by the teachers and by the school system that has determined what is the criteria that we will feed the students so that the students will fit into the society that we want them to fit into. So already our consciousness is being limited by the school system, which is set up so that we can feed the business system that's out there. We get into the business system, and the business system is there, and it's got a set of rules and regulations. And then we're, we're adapting that, and before you know, and then we get into the whole idea of relationships, and we've got an idea of what does it mean to be a husband, a wife, a parent, a grandparent, a daughter, a son. And we've got all these rules coming at us, and then we get religion coming at us from all different aspects, and we're being fed all this. So here I am, this individualization of infinite consciousness that is infinite, and this is what my consciousness is by the time I'm 40. I'm totally in a box. Totally boxed in, I feel confined, I now need to go out, I need to drink, I need to be medicated, I've got ADD, I am psychotic, I've got neurosis, I, I've got to have pills to make me feel better, to blow my mind, do some LSD, do something, like bring something on, let my mind be aware, you know where I'm going with this. You can go anywhere out there, go to any restaurant on a Friday or Saturday night and watch people numb themselves up because they don't understand that it's the box of thought that's limiting them. They think a substance is going to free them. It's not. 
What frees us is that when we can take our mind and we can expand our perception of the possibility within us and we can start to consciously recreate our own mental atmosphere, that's what happens. It's us, the power is in us, it's always been within us. And so, I started to look at my life this week as I looked at this idea of my talk and what happened. And a lot of people said, you've got an ideal life. I mean, married for 42 and a half years to the same woman? I said, well, that's your idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you seem happy with her? Well, I don't seem happy. I am happy. You have two beautiful children. You live in a great house in a great development. You've got nice cars. You dress pretty nice. You've got your health. You've got everything going for you. So people look at the shell, the, the Cincinnati shell, and they say, "Well, he was born with a silver spoon. That's why he's got that life." So I started to think back and said, well, "Wait a second. The spoon wasn't always silver, or was it?" I can remember, my earliest memory was four. And I can remember being at my grandmother, my Polish grandmother's house, with all the nine brothers and sisters of my dad, with all of their grandchildren, and we didn't have fun. We were very poor. We had food. Food was the way that we showed our abundance. That's how we grew up. If I got one new pair of pants a year until I got to high school, it was considerable. Lot. Everything was handed down to our family all over the place. Then I saw, well, why did my, then I wondered at five or six, why did my parents move clear across the Metroplex in Detroit? Why did they leave where all the family was? Because, you gotta remember, I came from a very Polish family, so this is back in the 50s. Very Polish family, so there was a Polish ghetto, a group of Polish people living together. But then my mother came from the Sicilian side, so there was an Italian ghetto. Now my parents at that time came together and they bridged that and they were very ostracized by both. Does that make sense? Ostracized. So we moved away so that we wouldn't feel the ostr ostracized. And because of that, we had no support. And I started watching how my life unfolded in school. I was not accepted because I, I was different. And I had to learn to accept that difference. See, it was my mind. I had to learn to accept. I had to play games in my own mind to be accepted. I had to find out, I had to go, Lee, was Lee enough, even though I was rejected over here? Because all the kids I went to school with, they were sons and daughters of the wealthy executives of Ford Motor Company, General Motors, and my father was a fireman. So I'm dancing on a dance floor where I shouldn't have had a key to, or I shouldn't have had a ticket to the dance. So I can remember going to college and seeing the difference. Then I remember being in my job, and I can remember uh, being at Chrysler's and just having bought our first home and, in, and the two weeks after was getting laid off. Not laid off, getting let go because they had a big crisis. So there you are with all this, no money in the bank, nothing, and you're let go. That's pretty critical, isn't it? My mind, though, didn't know limitation. So two weeks later, I had a job. Follow my career along. Same thing happened in 1987. Um, Crumb Forster brought me down here. Three years into the job, they closed the operation, out of a job. There I am with a wife, two children, a house, and all the bills that everyone could possibly imagine. I went five and a half months, got another job. Got let go in 2004 from being a VP of marketing for a large insurance company. All of a sudden, two-thirds of our income disappeared. How are we going to deal with it? Decided, well, well, that's a great thing. Let's go to school and let's use $30,000 to get a master's degree. So I went to school for three years to get a master's degree with no income coming in. And yet, we were fine. Then I became a minister. And now we're now, I'm in my eighth year of ministry. In the meantime, all that time is we're told we can't have children. Wanted kids, that was my number one value back at days ago. And then we adopted beautiful man in the back of the sound student. He is the, the creation of Gene and I that we decided, and two years later, Matthew came into our, into our world as well. Wife went through some physical challenges. And how do you deal when your wife goes through physical challenges? She's faced with her own mortality. 
How do you feel when you are faced with your own mortality in 2000? I was told I would need brain surgery. I would have to, I would have, to have brain surgery where they'd have to go into my skull and pull out a tumor. And I said no. And I, I healed. Through the power within me, I healed myself through prayer and diet. The tumor's gone. I had an MRI. It's gone. See, all these things happen, and I, I say this not to say that my life was that bad. My life was just my life. Things happen in our lives, but here's the thing. If we focus on the event, we're damned. We're going to be miserable. But if we focus on what is the event happens, but what's our purpose? Do we know our purpose in life? If we know our purpose in life, we ask the question with that event, how is that event feeding me to get to my purpose? What is this event trying to tell me? What is the contrast of this? Everything that happened in my life led me to this moment where I'm talking to you. See, my highest purpose is self-actualization. Meaning, for me, self-actualization means coming into the fullest expression of my gift, being able to speak, being able to teach, and being able to help others see that the power is within them and they can begin to change their life. That's my highest purpose. So when I look at things, I go, how does that fit in here? So when I had the tumor, before I even was going to be a minister, I said, how is that? Well, wait a second. I know these tools. How can I use these tools to heal myself? Well, if this stuff works, who better to try it on than me? So I did it. It worked. Then when my wife had her challenge, well, wait a second. Now I'm not doing it. So I get to step into a whole different role, right? Now the role is not helping, but supporting. See, there's two very, very differences between those two words. Helping means someone's not powerful enough to do it. Supporting means that you see the power in them, and you're there to be there for them. And so I got the opportunity to watch her create her own healing as a support. I got to be there with my sons using these tools as they went through the teenage years. We know what the teenage Jews are like. <coughs> they truly at times, and let me say, not only the teenagers, but the 20s, they can suck. There's no other way to say that. But the whole idea that I'm, I'm sharing that with you is, are you focusing on the higher goal? Are you focusing on your higher purpose, your higher vision, and saying, okay, what is this calling me to do? What is this calling, not even to do, what is this, how is this calling me to be? You see, most of the time, it's not about what we do. It's who we're being. And so in the state of crisis, I go back and I think about the idea that when I was in India in 2013 and we were trapped in the foothills of the Himalayas with no way to get out, that we would have to go through hike four and a half miles up the, the mountainside in order to get to a helipad, and there was no paths because they were washed out by the floods that we were caught in. I said, what was my higher purpose? Did I fear or did I believe that there was a higher being, there's a power in me that will guide me? And I meditated and I prayed before Naranja and I took that trek. When we took that trek, it was fascinating because you were outside your body watching, watching as you were 755th feet above the Ganga River. And there was a straight drop going down, but there was no fear because you realized there was no death. See, death is the illusion that holds us in its grasp. See, we are eternal expressions of life that in this moment are expressing in this physical body, in another moment, we'll be in some other way of expressing. I don't know what that is. It could be reincarnation, it could not. I'm not attached to it because why worry about that when I've got this? You see, we're here in this physical body right now to experience our senses, to experience them fully, perfectly, and completely while allowing the infinite wisdom within us to flow through us and guide us in that expression to the highest form of calling that we may decide for ourselves. See, that's the key. Have you made a conscious decision to decide how you're going to be in the world? 
What is that lofty expression for you? It's not the same as anyone else. Your expression is your expression. I think Kendall Lee's expression over there was to get me into her yoga studio. And she's got this thing called aerial yoga, where you get in these like silk things that you see in um, uh, Circle Lay shows. So she says, you're going to get in this, and I'm going to get you into an inversion. So I go, and she says, now you got to trust, you got to trust. And my God, I trusted. And next thing you know, I am completely upside down with my feet together like this, with my little hands. I can't do it right here, but I'm like this, except upside down. Does that look weird? <laughs> no, that's me. Um, and there I am, upside down. I would never have dreamed I could get in that position. But you see, I was open to the possibility, and I knew Kendra Lee would support me. She wasn't there to help me, she would support me. That's a real simple example of life. No matter what your challenge is, no matter what you're going through, if it's an illness, if it's a lack of a job, if it's self-confidence, if it's money, if it's a partnership, you are always surrounded by people or events or things that will support you. The question is, are you open to seeing it? When you're open to seeing the support, then it's no longer a big deal. If you're not open to seeing the support, the support then it's one-sided, and now we're lost. Now we feel the pain. Anytime we're not in balance, there is pain. Does that make sense? You see, when we're not in balance, boy, we can go down that rabbit hole like this. And there's no stopping us. The second we understand, you gotta say, wait a second, where's my balance? All of a sudden I start going, oh, I've got this going over here, this is going, this is going, okay, I'm starting to teeter. This is going, all of a sudden, the next thing you know, I've got myself in balance. That's the work. That's where you do meditation. That's where you do affirmations. That's where you do visualization. That's where you do forgiveness work. That's where you come in and you take your power. You see, no one else can do that for you. You are the only person that can do it for yourself. So if you're seeking to be rescued by anyone, let go. Ain't gonna happen. They can support you, they can guide you, they can give you their wisdom, but in the end, it's you that takes it and brings it forth because the power you are seeking is always in you. So is there bad happening to good people? No. There's just events happening to good people. We get to choose how we label it. We get to choose how we respond to it. We get to choose how does it serve in making a move toward that higher goal, that higher purpose. That's our life calling. You see, when we can embrace that, we are no longer a victim. We live in a world where we can't help but be touched by others. Because there's so there's seven and a half billion of us, plus all the animals and everything going on, that it's all going to have an impact. How we deal with it, that's a choice. How we deal with it is a life. How we deal with it is a calling. I want to thank you for joining us today. I am so grateful that you took your time to watch or listen to this message. If you found this message beneficial, I would ask you to go to our website. Once there, click on the Contribute button and experience the joy of conscious and purposeful giving. It is through your gifts that we are able to bring this message to the world. I would also ask you to please share this message with anyone you feel might benefit. Again, I wanna thank you for joining me and the Agape community as together we bring joy to life.